You're watching Taming the Bear, a virtual investor event in partnership with Think Markets. Hello and welcome to Taming the Bear, how to survive and thrive in a bear market. I'm Nadine Blaney from Ausbiz. Well, over the next hour, we'll discuss why bear markets matter for traders and investors and how long they can last. Also, strategy. So what companies and sectors are likely to thrive? We'll talk risk management and techniques to well, thrive, essentially make money, even in a bear market. We'll also discuss with my expert guests how to put your mind to it, so to speak. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for you, and as a bonus, they will answer your questions at the end of this masterclass. Feel free to send questions throughout the event via the Q&A that are on your screen. We'll be keeping a close eye on them, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of this masterclass. So, to get going, joining me to start this event, Carl Kapulinga from Think Markets and Nathan Samasundaram from Deep Data Analytics. Guys, welcome. Thanks. I've been looking forward to discussing all of this with you both. The definition of a bear market in the Oxford Dictionary is a market in which prices are falling, encouraging selling. Nothing more, nothing less. There's no 20% tied to it <laughs> okay. from highs to lows. What do you define as a bear market? Yeah, I'll, honestly, I had that, um, that definition. Uh, I've traditionally, um, you know, financial types would say a 20% correction from the, the, the top. And some people say, well, it's from the highest price that was achieved. Some people say it was from the best closing price. It doesn't really matter. Look, give or take 20%. Um, and then the next bear market doesn't start until we've rallied 20% from that low, typically. So that is the confines of this conversation. Now, we don't necessarily need to be in a bear market yeah. here in Australia to have this conversation because you never know what's around the corner. And Nathan, you're the data guy. You know the historics of all of these bear markets as much as anybody else. And I uh, can't believe it, but you've brought us a chart. I think this is the longest chart we've ever had on the program, dating back to the year 1800, Nathan. Why are we looking at a chart that goes back to the 1800s? It's, it gives you context to where we are, and I think that's the big thing. We, naturally, we have a psychological thing that we look at what happens in the short term and give it more credibility than what happens in the long term. So having a look at what's happened through the last couple of hundred years gives you a, a much better perspective. I mean, the interesting part about this is the first 150 years, the yields literally just slid lower. So we're talking bond yields. Yes, we're talking 10-year bond yields, the blue line, has been falling for the first 150 years of that. And then we had the World War II, then you had this you know, massive construction, wage growth, massive global growth recovery cycle, inflation picked up, and then we had that run from around the 50s to the 80s, where we had massive, I mean, it, people will remember interest rates at you know, 15, 16%. Yep. And then we had the 40 year cycle of falling bond yields. Yeah, okay, and so that is the historical context. We're in a bond, uh, sorry, we're in a bear market according to the stats, particularly coming from the bond market when you put it against inflation. So that's where we are today, the red line. Yeah, good. so that gives you some context to where we are on a relative basis. So the 30-year bond yield is important because that's pretty close to a proxy for the mortgage rates, what mm -hmm. people pay for, uh, and that's obviously a bit higher. Uh, and so when you look at that, where the inflation has gone up, every time inflation goes above that, you get massive pullback in asset prices. That plays through all asset classes. So that's the cycle that we're going through. So I don't think it's any hugely different. I think it's happening again now. And the property prices in the US are pulling back. And we've got property bubble globally for the same reason, because cost of debt went so low. Now that's resetting. And that's natural part of the cycle. So we are getting that. Great. All right. So we are in a bear market now. Carl, mm -hmm. when we think about a bear market, there's a final chart that Nathan has just uh, pointed out. Uh, well, explain what's on the chart now that oh, it's look, on it's the screen. The, the blue line is your cash rate from the US Fed. Now, mm -hmm. they're going to be updating us tomorrow morning. And, you know, market expects 75 basis point. I think that's the likely scenario. But you can see in the last decade, the bond yields, whether you're looking at the short data or the long data, haven't been able to get about 3% because we are carrying a, a lot of debt. So is, is this time any different? I don't think so. So I think the bond yields will flatten out after it gets around 3%. So the question is, when does the Fed change? At the moment, I don't think they're going to change. 
but market is betting on them changing as the recession fears start to rise. And that is when we will potentially see this bear market come to an end. So Carl, give us some perspective. We've got a, a chart that you've brought along, a graphic that shows the NASDAQ in historical context. Uh, it is showing us the duration of how long some of these bond, uh, these bear markets can be. And it's pretty diverse, isn't it? It goes from anywhere between one month to 31 months. Yeah, there's a wide range there, Nathan. Look, I mean, for Australia, and I know we keep talking about bear markets. Well, Australia, we're not, we didn't get to a bear market. We're down about 16%, so we didn't beat that traditional definition. But certainly if we look at uh, what's happened on the NASDAQ and indeed the S&P 500, they both went into bona fide bear markets. This current NASDAQ bear, bear market, or at least at the lows in June, down nearly 35%. And currently, as of as today, still running eight months. So in terms of your historical bear markets going back to the 87 crash, it's pretty typical. As in, we've gone down about as much as the median. The average, by the way, is about 38% because there's some dispersion there. And uh, on the timing, we're starting to run into one of the longer bear markets. And this is what concerns me here, is that uh, the short, sharp bear markets, where there was a, a sudden shock, you know, the, the, the pandemic is a great example. The 87 crash is a great example. Um, we tended to get through those fairly quickly. The, once you get past that average, they tend to draw out, and that's what I'm concerned about. So if you look at say, October 89, 12 months, and then the big one, the dot-com crash, 78% from 2000 to 2002, 31 months of so just withering declines. And I was, uh, it was one of the first bear markets I traded, Nathan. I know mm -hmm. you were very active uh, at that time as well, and I, and I do remember the, this, this feeling uh, initially of optimism uh, in the rallies, uh, and uh, incidentally, there were uh, nine bear market rallies of, of greater than 15% uh, but less than 20%. So, so um, the last one succeeded, but eight of them failed. Yeah. So eight yeah. times you thought this was the end, yeah. and it wasn't the end. So again, sort of bringing that back to what's happening now is uh, we're having a little bit of a bounce. Is this just one of those bounces? So um, to be forewarned is to be forearmed, and hopefully today we can give viewers some strategies to identify if this is just a bear market rally, if there's something uh, at the beginning of the next bull market, um, how to, how to, how to um, get in, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully when it's safe, and how to protect your capital if it's not going to be safe. Absolutely. We will get there in yeah. just a moment. But you've also brought along, and this is sort of the hopeful chart <laughs> as well, which shows the durations in blue of bull markets versus in orange bear markets and how long the recessions are as well. Mm. So not all is lost if you find yourself in a bear market. Yeah, no, look, uh, I, I think I, 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 now don't quote me on this stat, but I think it was about 16 out of the last uh, 26 uh, bear markets caused recession. So it wasn't, yeah. you know, just because you've got a bear market doesn't mean there's a recession. And quite often, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the, 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 when we're in the recession is often where the bear market ends because markets are forward looking. And that's the other thing viewers I think need to remember is that when we hit the recession, there's a good chance we've, we've probably factored in a lot of that. And now we're looking to the stimulus on the other side, which is what markets love. Uh, you can just see in terms of durations, you say relative durations, bull markets are so much longer. Um, you know, order of magnitude, four or five times longer than your bear market and significantly greater uh, in, in their gains as well. Um, another stat for you, roughly 78% uh, of the time, we're in a bull market. So 22% of the time we're in a bear market, but it's an important 22% to get okay. right. All right. Okay. So I think we've put some confines around what is a bear market, how long they can last this time around, what is triggering uh, this bear market. So that has set the scene for what we know is potentially facing traders and investors. Look, we'll be back to talk strategies after this very short break.
Welcome back to Taming the Bear and get ready for some real talk about strategies to help you not only survive but thrive in a bear market. Carl Capralinga from Think Markets is here. Nathan Samasandram still here as well. But we're now joined by Louise Bedford from TalkingTrading.com.au and Mandy Rafsanjani from TradingPsychology.com.au. She's joining us all the way from Germany. It's going to be good. I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, everybody, welcome. Louise, I will start with you. Is there some sort of a rule of thumb when we're entering a bear market that there are sectors that will outperform or underperform? Or how do you really go about identifying those? Yeah, it's such a good question. There already are signs that some sectors are hot and some sectors are not. So let's have a look at an example of the ones that are moving right now. So some of the hot sectors, energy, utilities and communication services, whereas the cold sectors, surely they outnumber the hot sectors. However, you've got things like IT, real estate and consumer discretionary. So when we have a look to see how do we determine what is hot compared to what is not, what we do is we have a look at the presiding index. So either the ASX 200 or the all odds in the Australian markets, and we compare each index with the Australian market overall index. We look at a relative strength comparison, and that can give us an idea about what is outperforming the general trend. Are still looking for outperformance in a bear market, Carl, correct? Yeah, I mean, Louise has mentioned the relative strength comparative, uh, not to be confused with the relative strength index, which is ultra important for me as well. So basically we're comparing the performance of a particular sector against the broader market. We're looking to target those uh, sectors with, with relative outperformance. You know, I'm a trend follower, bottom left, top right is my motto. So um, I, I think the message here is that even in the worst bear market, there's always a, a company or group of companies out there with a business model that's killing it. Okay, and, and I think in, in bear markets, those companies, um, because they, they're clearly doing well um, with the investment community, Nathan, as you know, tend to crowd in yeah. to those companies, which makes them do even better again. Um, so f for me, yes, there's still this element of um, not uh, allocating too much cash. Okay, I think that's important. Uh, and understanding strategies like short selling, I think that's another thing. Um, but also there are still opportunities to buy uh, the companies that we're, we're, you know, the investment community is crowding into. Yeah, because Nathan, you don't just throw your hands up in despair when a bear market comes around. No, there's, um, I mean, the beauty of bear markets is it, it makes people actually work harder. Yeah. Um, it's the, the bull market in a trending market, everyone's a genius. And when it gets to a bear market pullback cycle, that's when it gets really tested. Now, the interesting part is there's always going to be, you know, major sectors may struggle, but there'll be minor sectors, industry groups that benefit from it. So, you know, a classic example of some sectors actually do well in a rising interest rate environment. So in that context, you want to be exposed to those kind of sectors. Louise, we have your chart up on screen right now. We want to use charts in this event uh, to help, you know, really investors and traders understand what we're talking about. Louise, can you walk us through this hot sector example? Absolutely. So on the screen, we can see energy. And when we compare that to the All Lords, the relative strength comparison is rising and it's above its own moving average, not only on the index itself, but also in the REC chart, which is the chart below the actual red and green candles. So that does tell us that this is swimming against the tide. We've got a sector going up and compared to the overall market, it is doing quite well. So if you are looking to trade at the moment, then looking at stocks within that sector will give you some level of bang for your buck. But we do have to question, should we be trading at all? And that is something else to consider. Well, what is the answer to that, Louise? I mean, what is your sort of first rule of thumb to determine whether or not you should be trading at all in the environment we find ourselves in? 
I always like to apply a macro filter. Now a macro filter is your do I trade or do I not trade and under what circumstances do I actually decide to be involved in the market. So everybody who is watching this can apply a very simple macro filter by running a 30 week of moving average over the predominant index. Now when you've got your index prices above that moving average that means you can go long and when they're below you can go short. So if we just pop up the next chart I'll just show you what I mean by that and add in one little nuance. The That's a cold sector example so perhaps just the next one so we can talk the overall market. Perfect. Now what we've got here is the all odds and we can see currently that the prices or the index points are below the moving average which suggests a bear market and we also need to have a look at the volatility. That's that lower part of the chart there. So we've looked at the average true range and we've done this as a percentage of the index points. So currently on a week to week basis the share market in Australia is going up or down by 3% on average. Doesn't sound like much until you're involved in that position and then all haywire breaks loose. So we've got a situation where the volatility has gone up but it is starting to back off and because it's under my 5% rule I can actually trade the market short. That means that I can actually get into a short trade with some chance of volatility not pipping me out. Mandy Rafsanjani joining us from tradingpsychology.com.au. You too I believe, you know, look at shorting strategies in a bear market. Is it really important to keep all of these tools at your disposal? So, yeah, you know, it depends, Nadine, what kind of um, market participant you are, if you're a trader or an investor. So, um, you know, it, um, I predominantly trade, I don't invest, meaning I very often at the end of the day, I close my positions or um, maybe put on a swing trade depending on the setup. So for me, I'm more flexible because I'm daily active in the markets. Now, if you work full time and you're more of an investor, of course, you know, you're a little slower to react and other filters apply. So I personally am of the belief that I want to be uh, multi, like I want to be versatile. I want to go long and short. But having said that, also we know that everyone has one strategy that they're feeling more comfortable with, like we all are either left-handed or right-handed, but it still means that we can use the other hand as well, maybe not as good or not as natural. So absolutely, the more versatile you are, the more opportunities you can take advantage of. Now, Carl, we have a series of charts to show about how we can start looking at charts, using charts again uh, to, to determine how to make money and thrive in these bear markets. Uh, it's a NASDAQ chart, is it? Yeah, we've got a NASDAQ chart, but like it's, you know, thrive, uh, survive. I mean, these are the two key, key principles. And I'll tell you what, Nadine, I got uh, goosebumps when Louise had that chart up about the macro volatility. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought of, uh, I use price action, volume, volatility, three key factors, but I haven't thought of using a volatility indicator on a whole index. And what you saw there is the best trends come, uh, and Louise and I have very similar styles, and we follow these uh, trends, as you can see, and mine's the light green zones, viewers will be familiar with my, 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 my zones. Um, but obviously on the way up, it's, it's all light green, mm -hmm. price action is being supported by those trends, um, but volatility tends to be low and falling. And what Louise charts showed is that when you're reaching that market top, volatility starts to pick up. Nathan's nodding his head. And in bear, market, bear markets are about volatility. We can bring Louise's chart back up so well, we can yeah. hear what about, we're talking about. Uh, Nathan and I, uh, before we start, we're talking about now it's tough. It's tough. It's volatile. You think you're right. Next day, the market proves you wrong. The best time to be invested is when markets are rising and volatility is falling. Okay. That's not always the case. That's why we're here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. But you can see here we've got the GFC market top. That, that could be a chart of today. That could be a chart of today's NASDAQ because it did exactly the same thing. Green zones turned into orange zones. Orange zones turned into pink and red zones. 
volatility increases. Candles go from being white to being black. Price action goes from being high peaks and high troughs to lower peaks and lower troughs. So if you're new to the market and you're thinking that something happened to you this time around in this bear market that nobody's ever experienced it before, that's not true. It happened in 2007. It happened in the dot-com crash as well. But you have to know what you're doing, Nadine. And this is I guess why we're here today is to have a strategy. If you're always reacting to the market by definition, you don't have a strategy. And they say, you know what, if you don't have a plan, you're planning to fail. So uh, for me, I use uh, the trends on screen. Louise has something similar. Nathan has a very distinct strategy that he uses, so does Mandy. So for viewers out there, find, find a strategy. I think that's the message. Well, Nathan, that begs the question, what is your strategy? So we, we tend to look at things as a, it's not a one dimensional uh, solution. It's a multi-dimensional problem, so you have to come up with a multi-dimensional answer. So we look at investing on a market level, macro level, sector level, and stock level. So when all of them turn out to be on the right side of the investment cycle, then that's the time to look at that stock. Now, when one of those things go out of sync, there's something that's going to come through that hasn't already hit the stock. It may have happened at the market level, it may have happened at the sector level, but it hasn't flown through the stocks. We try and stay away from it. So those kind of approach for us flag when cycles turn. Now everyone loves a trend market. When a market is trending up, it's great. When you've got valuation on your side, when you've got the macro on your side, when you've got the Fed stimulating on your side, it's, it's a great cycle. But when those things turn, those things happen at the macro level. Then it happens to the market. Then it happens to individual sectors then it flows to the stocks. So everyone gets shocked when it hits the stocks. But if you looked at it at the higher level, you'll see it coming. It's a bit like surfing. You see the wave. Initially, you get the small wave. It builds, it builds, it builds. You don't want to be late to the wave because you're going to get the wash. So it's a matter of managing your cycle where you are and understanding which part of that cycle and then knowing when to get in and when to get out. So don't fall in love with it. But you make that, sorry, I'm yeah. going to push the point. You make that sound easy, knowing sure. when to get in and when to get out. Carl, you're a man that would say you yeah. need the charts to do so. Well, that's where the, the technical analysis comes into it, because it helps pinpoint point your entry. So, yeah, look, Nathan's right. I mean, I like to have a top-down uh, view and understand where the market trends are going. And I call that, uh, I call that often my heart of where I think the market's going, and then the, the, the charts in my head. So I won't, uh, I won't go against the trend. So even as much as I might be bullish, if the charts turn down, as we saw, I'll be looking um, to exit, go to cash. I think cash is a wonderful place to be in a bear market, Nadine, um, because you can't lose money in, in cash. So don't be afraid. We, often we think, I make the most money when I'm invested in a bull market with low volatility, sure. But as markets start, start to transition, that's going to cost you money, that, that, that mode of thinking. Sometimes the best thing you can do is be out. And I'd love to talk at some stage about the short selling part. The actual... Well, talk now. Well, it's, it's, it's so at odds with... I mean, I've been uh, counselling retail clients now for about 20 years. And for me, in my experience, this is the hardest thing to get across the line with people. This idea that I can make money from something going down. It's just so obscure. Um, and, of course, part of the uh, mechanics is, well, I need to borrow somebody's shares to sell them at a high price and buy them back at a low price. And well, in the olden days you had to, now we've got these newfangled things called CFDs where you don't need to worry about that ownership part. You literally, if you think something's going down, you enter the amount, hit the sell button, uh, and if it goes down, you get it right. Of course, if it goes up, you get it wrong. Um, but it's a bear market. Most stocks are going down. So if, if, you're, if you're all about trying to, um, you, know, uh, you know, bull markets are great, everything's going up, but and it's easy to make money, you've got to switch that thinking around. If bear markets are about everything going down, then it's also easy to make money. And again, it's just about following uh, those trends that I've talked about. And I talk about them all the time in Osbys uh, and finding out the, the best ones to do. Okay. Uh, look, we'll return to one of your charts where we can use it as a sort of a case study. But Louise, I'd like to return to one of your charts, which was a cold sector example in a bear market, which, of course, you've got listed here as consumer discretionary. It's uh, no wonder why. Yeah, look, here we've got the prices or the, actually the index points underneath the moving average. And really that relative strength comparison has been dropping like a stone. It's only just tucked its head up above its own moving average, which shows a slight sign of life. But the reason why we're seeing that sign of life is because the rest of the market has been going down so significantly. With relative strength comparisons, we're comparing the weight or the drop 
in one instrument compared to the drop in another. So just recently, consumer discretionary has been dropping at a slower rate compared to the overall market, which is nothing to brag about if you're trying to go long. No. Uh, Carl, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, look, the, look the, the toughest thing when uh, markets are going down, um, if you've only got that mindset of what to buy, is when to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, because the risk is you, you get in too early. So, I mean, that's another great example of Louise having, having a methodology, um, having a set of rules that you can then measure yourself by and say, well, did I follow my rules? What was the result? Was it good or bad? Um, if it's good, continue to follow the rules. If it's bad, you might need to adjust your rules. But if, you're, um, if your approach is very random, so you're responding to something you saw on Ausbiz, something you read in the paper, something the cabbie told you on the, on the <laughs> way into the studio, um, that's not a consistent methodology. How do you measure if something goes right or wrong uh, what it was? Was it the cabbie's advice that, <laughs> that got me that, that great result? So and I think until viewers commit to this idea of being more systematic, uh, whether it's a fundamental macro approach that Nathan has or more of a rules-based approach that um, Louise, Mandy and I have, um, get a plan uh, and then start to measure yourself based upon that. Now, Carl, I shall ask you this question, Nathan. Um, how important is it in a bear market to diversify your exposure to different asset classes? I think it's hard in the last couple of years because of the amount of market manipulation from central banks. They've actually correlated all these asset classes that are supposed to be non-correlated. Um, and it's hard to explain to investors that at this point in the cycle when mar central banks are trying to get out of the market, a lot of these um, non-correlated asset classes that, that are now correlated are unwinding. So you've seen a substantial pullback in uh, bond market, but the equity markets have started that pullback later. So we're in that cycle, but I still think the asset allocation uh, is important. And I think you need to understand that when you are getting into an coming out of manipulation into a normalized cycle, there will be volatility, but it will offer you opportunities. Everyone knows that the bond market has ma made a massive pullback. In, in a shorter term, bond market actually looks interesting at this point in the cycle. Now, every time the US 10-year gets to around 3%, it actually looks pretty decent in the short term. Now, it matters for an overall portfolio perspective. So I think you have to always look at your asset allocation and be dynamic about it because we are having 40, 50 year cycles turning. So asset allocation is important and that is a, one of the key parts of risk management. And risk management is one of those skills that people ignored since the GFC. We should be paying attention to risk management because risk management gets you, basically stops you doing stupid things. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Risk management is there to tell you when there's a red flag, yeah. you're doing something that you shouldn't be following, then manage that. So that kind of protects you against your own level of uh, investment optimism. Yeah, look, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, you know, money is often how you keep score. So if you're losing money, there's probably something you're doing wrong or you're out of step with what the market conditions are. So I think you need to be a little bit humble about that uh, and, and start to change your behaviour. Um, and, and a lot of people think when we talk about risk management uh, and diversification, a lot of people think, well, diversifying is having BHP, Rio and Fortescue <laughs> and maybe some Indres. And yeah, now, right. now, I'm, now I'm diversified. I've got all the iron ore yeah. miners in my portfolio. It's a very Australian investor way of thinking of it. But, you know, true diversification for me is not just diversifying across sectors, but uh, as Nathan says, diversifying across asset classes. So maybe you're looking at these strategic entry points uh, to get into some bonds. If you don't know what they are, don't just assume, oh, it's not for me. Go and learn about them uh, and learn how to get involved. Um, for us at Think Markets, a lot of clients... Um, just before the Russian invasion, started buying uh, crude oil. And they did really well out of it because they just connected the dots. I mean, markets started to go down because of inflation fears. Well, why is there inflation? Well, oil's going up, natural gas is going up, uh, things like wheat are going up. These are all tradable instruments if you know how to do it. Um, so you've got to get out of this mindset a little bit of, oh, I'm stuck in BHP and my four banks. And if you want to make money in bear markets, start to think about, well, what, what's happening in the world? And how do I take advantage of that? It's actually a lot easier now than it used to be. I mean, if you look at it 10 years ago, people couldn't get access to multi-asset investment. Now there's so much ETF. Mm -hmm. You can actually get a sector exposure or an asset class exposure through ETFs. So it's actually much easier for you to get on the market, get on most trading platforms and get access to very different asset classes very quickly and you know pick up a good yield out of different asset classes. You know, so in that context, it opens up a lot of opportunities 
it's a matter of expanding your investment horizon. You know, picking up a few stocks here and there and making money has been great, but that doesn't always work. So now you have to look at it differently, look at different asset classes, just like stocks. You know, it's an asset class that delivers certain features, it benefits from certain macro conditions. Okay, Louise, when you're in a position and the tides are turning, how do you know when to get out? It's such a good question because so few people consider this. We need to have a premeditated exit point before we even enter that position. Without that, as soon as we're in the market, it just seems like our brain leaks out our left ear. So to know that exit point, to have that stop loss in place, so ideally it is triggered automatically, you don't have to think about it, you are taken out of the position at a particular price point, is essential. So for me personally, I use average true range and a multiple of average true range. So let's say it's three times the average volatility, three times say 10 cents, so I'd do 30 cents below that share price action. But I'm taking it based on the personality of that position, based on its volatility and a multiple of that volatility. Okay, so there are sort of hard and fast little rules of thumb then that you can use. How much do you personalize those? I mean, it's somebody will probably be writing down your equation and you need just applying that to their own filters, but is it more nuanced than that from trader to trader, Louise? I think it's so important that we consider, as Mandy mentioned, are you trading, are you investing? Because without that overview and out, without knowing why you're involved in the share market, you're going to be making haphazard decisions and we can't do that, particularly in today's market. What we need to do is follow a set trading plan. So Carl, absolutely, you and I are yet again akin here. We need to detail our entry our exit and our position sizing. We need to have it all very specifically laid out so that during times of trading pressure, we can follow that plan to the letter. And that is the only way that I have ever seen my traders succeed. All of the traders that I've trained in my mentor program, the best ones are the ones that are very consistent with the way that they apply their trading plan. Mandy, I can't imagine you're disagreeing with any of that to a great degree, but what do you have to add when it comes to strategically knowing when it's time to call a quits on a position? Uh, it's such an interesting conversation and, you know, it's like, you know, as many different opinions as there are traders out there. So if I talk about what I see in terms of traders that I've worked with, um, when we look at the different personality profiles, not everyone is someone who um, um, likes to follow plans, right? So I have actually a lot of traders who are very intuitive. And if you were to ask them, how do you trade? How do you decide when to get in, when to get out? They can't articulate it at all. And um, so, for example, a friend of mine, he just joined the Seven Figure Club and did really well trading an elderly guy who trades US stocks. And he can't describe his strategy at all. He's so intuitive. Um, and, you know, you ask him about his money and risk management, money management more so he, so how much he allocates to a stock, uh, to, to a particular trade, but his risk management on when to get out is really more intuitive. But the thing is, he's very disciplined. He gets out when he sees things changing. And that's very where most um, traders or even investors trip up, where they say they should get out and they know they should get out, but they're not getting out. So I've seen so many different ways of trading and risk management. And one of them is um, definitely what Louise has described. Okay. Carl, uh, let's bring your chart uh, up on screen just so we can get a bit of a detailed look into how you are using charts and reading the price action, your traffic light signal, so to speak, um, to really get across what investors and traders can look for. So this is the Telix Pharmaceuticals chart that you've brought along. Yes. Let's bring it up. Yes. What are we looking at here? Yeah, look, I know this is a deliberately, it's, it's a busy chart because I've taken this from my um, RC Experts webinar, which I do on Tuesdays. Um, uh, find me on Twitter, the registration link is there. Every, everybody's welcome. Uh, it's very educational. I talk about my training methodologies and this is just a markup from there. 
Um, but we can see uh, the, the transition from, say, a demand side market on the left to a supply side market on the left. Uh, on the right, this idea of uh, following, following the trend to the upside, buying pullbacks, uh, to selling rallies, where um, we go from white candles to black candles, from high peaks and high troughs to lower peaks and lower troughs, um, from you know, uh, green supporting moving averages to moving averages resisting price action. But at some stage, we get over to the far right, um, past this bear market phase, and things can get, start to go up again. So if we, you know, we've talked a lot about bear markets, but maybe maybe the discussion pivots, Nadine, you're, you're the boss here, but pivots to well, what happens on the other side. And we can see that's just the reverse. This is how um, prices just cycle between excess demand, excess supply, and then back to excess demand. So we do the reverse. Instead of um, lower peaks and lower troughs, we're back to higher peaks and higher troughs. We're back to white candles. We're back to very shallow pullbacks and very strong gains. Um, we break through areas of supply, volume uh, starts to increase again. So uh, it, it comes back to what Louise said, is have a plan. This is my plan. Um, Louise does a fantastic job with her uh, mentor clients. And uh, you know this idea of, um, she talked about average true range and volatility. There's a lot of jargon there. Um, so get educated, get educated, find out what these things mean. It's not beyond anybody in my experience. Nadine. I was going to say, normal people can learn to read a chart. They might not do as much drawing <laughs> on it as you, but they can start to see what the signals yeah. are telling me. I've been teaching, teaching people this stuff, technical analysis, as I said, for almost 20 years, and I've never met somebody who wasn't capable of getting at least a basic grasp. So, Nathan, I, I feel like you're here sort of representing the investors, yeah. uh, more of a fundamental view of markets, but I can see you smiling and nodding your I'm head when every I'm chart teach, comes I'm up teach, on teach the screen. I'm going to teach Nathan how to do it as well. Oh, <laughs> look, I mean, it, the interesting part is everything is linked but people don't realize they are. Mm -hmm. So for example, the classic quant factor is 12 month moving average, sorry, 12 month pr price performance. Now, the biggest uh, technical uh, analyst number is the 200 day moving average that everyone uses. They're almost the same. Yes. It's just the 200 day moving average is slightly faster mm -hmm. at telling you the turn than the 12 month price performance. Now, interestingly, that's a really high performing factor. When 12 month price performance is going up, it's a really good factor to back. And so the, I can understand where the technical analysis comes in because of the momentum. And momentum is a huge factor. And for the last 40 years, that's pretty much been working consistently apart from a few crashes. And crashes tend to happen. Uh, but the beauty of it is, for me, is that understanding what's driving those changes allows you to then navigate those uh, periods where you know 20 to 30% of the time, you're gonna have a pullback or a correction or whatever and then adjust to the next cycle. So having going through the cycles, I think it's great. Understanding when the cycle gets to the end of that cycle is important, and the fundamental data allows you to do that so that you can, you can position yourself for that next cycle. So again, right now, uh, people, are, people are a bit worried because things are volatile. I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon, but that will set to a new cycle. The question is, don't set yourself a particular strategy and say, that's it, no matter what happens, I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Just understand what's happening in the market. Is that affecting the strategy that you're following? If it is, evolve with that, to make the changes and go to the next level. We're veering into my next segment on psychology. Everybody's okay. ready to get into putting their mind into it. But before we Can, leave so this- Can I ask Nathan yeah. one, one question? Where he thinks we are in the cycle and does he think there's another leg down in this, in this move? Yeah, I, I think there's another leg down because uh, the market hasn't had a real panic. So if you look at, I'll give you one data point that kind of gives, gives it away. The margin lending in the US, with the pullback has been about 20%. Every crash, it doesn't end till it gets to about 40, 50%. Mm, okay. So we haven't had the panic stage yet. Everyone is assuming that when things get tough, the Fed will backflip. But this has been once in a 40 year cycle where inflation has gone up. I think the limitation of what Fed can do is very limited they have to bring back cost of living. Whether that's through a nice move or a hard move, they have to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that will create at some point a panic. When that panic kicks in, that'll be the last leg. All right, listen, I just want to cover off strategies before yeah. we leave this little conversation, which you know could go pretty much all day. <laughs> but so we're talking don't throw out shorting strategies yes. and you need to educate yourself on the possibilities there. Hedging, you know, essentially the same thing, really. Yes. Um, do you have any particular strategy when it comes to hedging? Yeah, well, hedging simply involves having a bet each way. Yeah. So this is 
where we can dial it back to investors, uh, people with long-term portfolios that I discussed, your, your BHP, your REA and your four banks. So this is the uh, diversification. This is part of the diversification. So if you're using something, um, some of uh, you're just listening to, to, to Nathan, because he's on Ausbiz regularly, says some wonderful things for viewers uh, to take into account and consider, and you think, well, he's right. There is another leg coming. Uh, I've got all this exposure. I don't want to sell my portfolio. I've had it for so many years. There's tap capital tax uh, gains, implications, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And I don't feel comfortable being naked without my portfolio anyway. OK, well, um, again, through CFDs, you can start to take these strategic shorts, almost betting against your portfolio. Um, so if Nathan is right, there is another leg down, you're effectively locking in a price here on your portfolio. So as your portfolio falls, the value of your short positions are rising. Mm -hmm. uh, and then hopefully, you listen to Nathan, Nathan says, that's the ding, 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 that's the bottom, everyone. Get back in. Uh, by covering back your shorts, you take your profit. Now, the great thing about if you get that right, you've got all this extra money now to invest at a market low, okay, into your favourite stocks again. So now that's your best case scenario, of course, if the market goes back up. It's not so bad because your portfolio is compensating for mm -hmm. your, your loss in your, in your shorts, but that is the risk of hedging. Hedging is not without risk. There's no free lunches yeah. in markets. And, um, you know, what you could lose on your hedge, you make back on your portfolio. So it yeah. balances it. You, you give up a bit of return yes. yeah. for that insurance policy. Yeah. That's, that's the way you have to look at it. Okay, so diversification, risk management. I think we've covered it all. There's plenty more to come, of course. Uh, we're just going to take a bit of a short break and keep those questions coming in. We'll be back with Louise, Mandy, Nathan and Carl after this very short break. Welcome back to Taming the Bear. And yeah, we are going to be talking about getting your mind into it, so to speak. And uh, joining us once again, we have Carl Kapulinga uh, from Think Markets. We have Louise Bedford joining us and Mandy Rajafasani joining us as well from Trading Psychology. So it's really important, uh, I've been told, to gain control of your emotions and understand really what is driving your trading behavior, and that can really help tip the scales in your favor. So how do you really find out how to improve your decision-making process? So again, welcome back to the panel. Let's get Mandy to kick it off, because Mandy, if we just think back to where we've come from, I mean, there is the potential for a lot of mistakes to be made in mindset, I would imagine, when you're transitioning from a bull market to a bear market. You don't want the glory days to go away. Yes, absolutely. You don't want the glory days to go away. And as Carl mentioned before, so many traders and investors have done really well in this bull market. And the, the tricky thing is that they have learned all the skill on how to trade in a, a bull market, but not how to trade in a bear market. So what I saw the main mistakes traders and investors made um, just from the clients that I've worked with, the thought of, oh, it's just a retracement because it has been a retracement in the last 10 years. There was always another leg up. Um, they try to trade this bull market rhythm. But again, as Nathan and Carl described, the bear market has a very different behavioral pattern than the bull market. And so when you try to trade in the same rhythm as it used to be in the past, um, 
you know, a lot of them got really eaten up alive, um, especially you know, with the volatility increasing. We had, you know, one minute candles that were like 100 points on the Dow, for example. So the volatility needed, uh, so the money in risk management needed to be adjusted to the new volatility. And a lot of traders, investors that I came across um, didn't do that. And so they really got stuck in, in bigger losses than they thought they would have or wanted to have. And that then triggered behavioral patterns like going on tilt, um, Martin getting, so adding to losing positions, etc. Okay, so there is a, a transition that needs to take place from bull thinking to bear market thinking. Louise, Absolutely. again, with your rules of thumb, is there a particular rule of thumb that you need to at all times go into a bear market with, you know, a loss that you will just not stomach? I think this is such a great way to look at it too, because not only do we need to protect ourselves, we also need to protect those around us. So a lot of people are trading with a spouse looking anxiously over their shoulder, and we need to take into account their thoughts and feelings as well. So before getting involved in the market, if you do have somebody else that's relying on you for bringing in the bucks, I suggest that you organise for yourself an if then statement. Now, this is straight out of the weight loss industry. If somebody brings me a donut at work, then I will politely decline, for example. So it's pre-considering a potential for devastation. And it's a great way to go because in the markets, you can say, if I have lost 25% or more of my money, then I will stop entering new positions and I will consult a higher authority, perhaps a mentor, maybe Carl or Nathan or Mandy. And that way you're protecting yourself from an eventuality that you can't escape from. And you're helping the other people in your lives see that you do have limits. We know that if you lose 25% of your money on the remaining money, it's going to take you 33% to get back to break even. So we need to protect ourselves from these downside losses so that we can learn to trade another day and we can get those lessons that we need in order to be successful. Carl, there's no shame in asking for help, is there? No, look, not at all. And uh, look, uh, for me, my personal journey, um, you know, I was always a smart kid growing up. I got straight A's, never asked for help. And that was fine up to a certain point when, um, you know, you got to university, this bigger, smaller fish in a bigger pond, didn't ask for help. And you know, I, I struggled in, in certain subjects. And it, it also reflected back in my investing where, you know, I'm a smart guy, I'm going to figure this out. And uh, Nathan and I would often talk about this dot-com uh, crash. That was where I really sort of cut my teeth. Mm -hmm. Went from hero, uh, uh, sorry, went from Not zero. Just, went from yeah. zero, no, you know, money, you know, punting, uh, uh, Cinex? Yes. Cinex and uh, all these dot-com stocks and, you know, uh, money I'd saved up working in a supermarket job. I'm not, not kidding, I turned it into a million dollars in about nine months. Um, I turned that million dollars back into zero in the next 31 months of that bear market, uh, that NASDAQ bear market we talked about. And much of it was because I was just belligerent. Uh, I will f I'm a smart guy, I will figure this out. I'm a smart guy, I'll figure this out. Um, and it wasn't until, I, again, I sought some help and it was a, a mentor, um, I won't mention his name, but a very, very special person to me that uh, sort of took me under his wing a little bit. And, and the thing he taught me was, the, the, when it comes to investing, the first thing you have to do is um, avoid big losses at all costs. You need to get to the other side of that tough time because if you don't have any capital left, then the, the rebuilding is, is, is immense. So um, if you've lost uh, you know, 90 percent of your capital, you need to make what a thousand percent to get back to where you were. So uh, Louise is absolutely correct. And what, you know, I know what she does with her clients is set out a plan, a step-by-step -step plan for them to follow, not in terms of how to get in and out of the market, but how to manage their risk. And it's so important if you don't have it, um, it's, like, you know, it's like driving a car without insurance. Well, Mandy has been kind enough to give us her thoughts on how you can gain back control and really thrive in a bear market. Uh, Mandy, it all begins with, again, cutting your losses, right? Yes, I mean, it's easier said than done. If you look at the broker data, you know, 99% of traders don't um, succeed because they don't cut their losses. 
So if you can just conquer this one thing of cutting your losses, you're ahead of the majority of people in the world. So when we look at why people can't or traders can't cut their losses, it's because what is it that they're focused on? And often they're focused on wanting to avoid a, lo avoid a loss. Um, start shifting your focus to, I want to preserve my capital. And I really saw that when you look at someone like Linda Rushke, you know, market wizard, and, and any trader who's doing really well, they think so differently to the traders who are struggling. It's, it's like black and white. And again, it's capital preservation. They know their strengths, right? So we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And as Nathan said so beautifully, we need to protect ourselves from our own stupidity or AKA weakness that often traders and investors don't want to admit, right? That's, that's a different conversation, but you know, be okay with having your weaknesses and playing to your strength. And look at what does a sequence of losses mean to you? When I ask traders who are not doing so well, it always means something about them. You know, I'm not good enough. I will never achieve my dreams. I will never succeed. Um, people will laugh at me. No, all it means is that if you could have done better, you would have done better. And there's something for you to learn. And I totally agree with um, asking for help because, you know, the fastest way to, to um, achieve your goal is to learn from those who already are doing what you want to do. So why not shortcut your journey instead of trying to figure it out yourself? Because yes, we say you need to adjust your strategies now to a bear market, but hey, that's easier said than done. Um, I'm working with a trader at the moment who is looking for a new strategy because his bull market strategy is definitely not working anymore. And what he's doing, he wants to do it on his own, which is fine. But what he's doing is looking at different strategies and we going back to um, the last six months and he's back testing them on trading sim, a simulation software. Um, we have beautiful simulation software on um, MT4s as well, MT5s which is called um, soft for Forex. And then looking at how many times did this particular setup occur in the market? How many times did it fail? And how many times did it succeed? And he had a strategy that he thought is going really well. Well, in June, it only gave him a 38% profit loss ratio with a three R return. You can't live off that. Right? so he always thought there's something wrong with him until we did this exercise and he realized his strategy simply didn't work. So. Why not go to someone like Carl, like Nathan, like Luis, and look for a strategy that is actually already proven and shortcut your journey? Yet, yeah, Mandy, you're so generous with your trading stories. You don't tell us who's behind them, of course, but you've, you've brought us a chart that shows, well, what do we call it? Do we call it revenge trading? Yeah, so there's two types. There's revenge trading, which is um, essentially going on tilt, and the other one is Martin Gellingson. So this one was a trader who did really well in the last 10 years. And um, so I could say trader because he's more short term, you can see. And the market went up until, um, you know, until it actually started going down here. And you can see he started buying the dip and then um, there was a red candle. That's a daily chart of the uh, XJO, by the way. Um, so he got nervous, he closed his long and went in short and then there was a blue candle and he's like, oh, I think it's going up. I got it all wrong. So he closed his short at a little loss and went long and then it collapsed. But he stayed in it. He didn't get out because he thought, oh, you know, it worked out all the last 10 years. You know, I was always safe and um, the market still went up. So he bought more. Then he got insecure again. So you can see buying, um, selling, buying, selling. That is going on tilt. And it accumulates with little losses. And that's driven not by skill. This is driven by anger, by frustration. And then, you know, you get tunnel vision. And also the news started becoming more desperate, right? So fear is mongering in the news. You know, the um, recession goes up. There's not enough food because of the, of the floods, um, the war in Ukraine. We underestimate the impact this has on our um, stress levels. That's unconsciously... Um, affecting our stress levels and then we are in stress, we can't make good trading decisions, decisions anymore. So when you feel you get like really agitated and you start getting in and out of your trades really quickly, man, you know, stop immediately and start looking at what you're doing and engage your brain again. Because what we often see is that the brain completely goes blank in those moments of going on tilt. And I see that, I saw that a lot in the first few months of when the market turned. 
traders went on tilt so much more than usually. A very mm. interesting. Now you said martingaling. What is that? I do believe that we have a chart. Maybe you can ex explain yes. it to us. So maybe traders watching think, oh yeah, that's me. I don't want to do that. Yes. So that's why I love explaining on charts what that actually looks like, because in theory, it sounds so beautiful, but you don't realize you do it yourself. So you can see the green areas where uh, this trader kept adding to his long positions, to his portfolio. So actually, he's more of an investor, not, not a trader. And um, that worked all well until um, I believe March was the top in the XJO. So we had the first top in January. It came down. So he kept buying got rewarded for buying um, into his losing positions. But then he kept doing the same thing after March. He kept buying, but then it wasn't rewarded anymore because the market um, came down. So martingaling really means that you have a losing position. So you, have, you know, dollar cost averaging is another word for it. And um, he got punished for it. He had a really big loss because he didn't close out his longs. He just kept adding to the longs. And that was really a lack of skill. And that was applying a bull market strategy that worked for the last 10 years in a market that had clearly changed in the last six months. And when you have someone like Mason, who has a forward look, who can say, based on what we see in, in the yields and in, in the bonds and so on, we can see there is going to be a change in the markets that would have protected him if he had had that kind of knowledge. It was really just lack of knowledge and skill, which is good news because now we could work on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always blue sky above the clouds. Yes. Louise, what if it's raining on you? What if you have taken a loss? What, what should you do? I do think we need to pre-consider these ideas because everybody is going to take a loss. The first thing to do is remember to breathe. I have watched my traders put on trades and here is the interesting thing. I've actually coined a phrase called trading apnea where people are about to put on an order and they breathe in and then they hold their breath. Oh my goodness, do you really think you don't want your brain to have oxygen at that point? No, what we need to do is breathe. So just calm the heck down. Take a little bit of a step back and realize that you need to get in touch with your body and to focus on what is happening to you here and now. That is the first step when anybody has any sort of hit from the side that they weren't expecting. So once you've done that, the idea would be to think, did I follow my trading plan? Because if you did follow your trading plan, and you've taken a loss, you have to consider that that is a good trade. It's a good trade because you thought about it in advance, you followed the structure, and that is the result that we have to expect as traders and as investors. The majority of people are going to get things wrong 50% of the time or more. That's just fine. That is totally to be expected because when we're making the wins, we want to capitalize on those wins and be a pig in the markets, which is pyramiding into the positions that are doing exceptionally well. So if you have followed your trading plan, I do urge you to keep a trading journal. Write down what did I do well and what would I do differently? in this particular trade. And in years to come, as you look back through that journal, that will really help you ascertain your personal areas of weakness and the areas that you need to improve. When I wrote one of my first books, actually, Trading Secrets, that's exactly what I did. I went through my journal going back 20 years, going, what in the heck did I do wrong? And what are the areas that people need to really focus on to be an exceptional trader? And of course, the final step is to work out whether you need help. Now, I urge everybody to do a six-month review of all of their results. The maintenance step is completely skipped by the majority of traders. They don't look back to see which of the trades they followed their rules for versus which they didn't. And I do suggest people use an archetype, which is their identical perfect trade, that one that looks like it's going off into blue sky, that they try to match with every new position. I do urge you to create an equity curve of archetypal trades, ones where you totally followed your rules, and non-archetypal trades, where you didn't follow 
your rules so that you can put a monetary value on your non-compliance with your trading plan. How much did it cost you to defy your rules? If you weren't disciplined, that has hit your hip pocket. So how much has it hit your hip pocket? That will help discipline you into being a more mm -hmm. effective trader in the future. As seeing things in black and white often does, Carl, yeah. that sounds, um, that sounds even like for investors question. though, you know, like fail to plan, plan to fail. Yeah, I was just gonna say, that, that sounds like hard work. <laughs> everything everything Laurie's talked about, that sounds like really hard work. That's going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of um, self-reflection, a lot of time on spreadsheets. Uh, and who would have thought that becoming a successful investor would take a lot of time and a lot of hard work? Because I think that's maybe at odds with many newer investors that have come into the market mm -hmm, recently yeah. that thought, well, this, this is easy. Everything's going up. I'm making money. I'm telling my friends. My friends are telling me and then the market changed. So this, I think what we're talking about now is, well, where do I go from here if you have lost money? Um, if you had X and now you've got far less than X. Well, the good news is you can change. Uh, I've done it. Uh, I'm sure Nathan's done it. I'm sure Louise has done it. I'm sure Mandy's done it. So mm -hmm. that's the good news. Um, start to go through these processes. Um, the, the, the advice here today has been excellent. Of uh, no, no, can't say uh, anything um, at odds with anything that's yes, been said. Yeah. Uh, but take that responsibility onto yourself because nobody else is going to do it for you. No, it's it's you're, you're in it to make money. Yes. It's not going to happen with no effort on your part. Yeah. Look, I I know we're going over. Uh, I'm hoping my guests can stay for just five more minutes to try to get through some of the questions that have been coming in. Louise Bedford, Mandy Rajasvatani, and Carl Kapalinga, as well as Nathan Samasandram, here after this very short break. Welcome back to Taming the Bear. Wonderful to have you along with us and also wonderful to have our expert guests sticking around a little bit over time to answer some of the questions that have come in. At look, Nathan, maybe I'll throw this first one to you. I don't actually have who it's from, but it says, what is the short term or what sectors of the market will do better in a bear market? Can we generalize that far? So you've got to look at where the thematics are still in, on the positive side in a, in a bad market. So for me, the big thematics have been food. Uh, they were positive before the war. The Ukraine war has added to that. So that remains pretty positive. Um, where the, we are playing it through the agriculture uh, services providers, especially the chemicals and um, things like elders, mm -hmm. because most of those kind of businesses, they're doing really well because the farmers are doing well. So they will be doing well for years to come. So that's one of the positive thematics. The other one is, for me, yes, Walmart came out with a bad result, but supermarkets in Australia are really well positioned because they're a hedge on inflation because no matter what the cost is, they just put their margin on that and you pay because you don't have a choice. Uh, so they tend to do well. Uh, the energy retailers like Ampol, um, they do well because similarly, they've got the margin expansion, they just added to it. So they're defensive. Insurance sector, again, they benefit from fixed income doing better. So higher yields, insurance sector does well. Premiums are rising. So there are a number of sectors like that doing well. To answer another question just quickly, uh, in terms of asset allocation, would this include having something like a bit of exposure to REITs? Yeah, we got out of REITs more than a year ago, okay. and we are staying out because in a rising environment, yields to REITs tend to underperform. They've had a really big cycle on updating their uh, NTAs we're going to start seeing those things roll over. So be careful in the reads. Carl, this is for you. When you're talking about shorting strategies, do you believe that ETFs play a role, potentially Bear and BBOZ as an investment strategy? Yeah, look, I mean, I guess the message is get something, get, get a tool. I mean, uh, they're better than not having a tool. Um, for me, though, as a stock picker, so I guess the argument is, well, on the way up, do you buy an ETF, a basket? 
um, and get the average, or do you back yourself uh, and your abilities and try and pick stocks on the way up? So I guess the advice I would say there is if you're able, you have a methodology where you can uh, find the, the better shorts because let's face it some things go down a lot a lot further and faster than others uh, then no look to target individual stocks that would still be my preference yeah louise this one i think is directed toward you because you did have in your cold sector consumer discretionary uh viewer is saying is it wise to sell these fallen stocks now or better to ride out the fall i know that there's a lot in that and you don't know the person or their personal circumstances although it does say super fund in pension mode um, maybe just talk to us about knowing when to get out. I think it is really important that if you haven't got out of something and it's already dropped a fair way, that you start from now and you set a stop. Work out where your pain threshold lies and if it goes beyond that, then exit. We can't know the future. We really have no idea what is going to happen. We can do, do what we can with the data, absolutely, but we can't know for sure. So to protect yourself is always the best way. We in a lot of ways are subject to the rules that we set out. So if you can set those rules from today onward, you're going to put yourself in the best possible position. So few traders follow a written trading plan. And in fact, the stats say only about 7% of people use a written trading plan, but they are the ones that are making the majority of the money in the markets. So work out from today where you should exit and stick to that plan. Mandy, final question to you. Um, everybody asks, you know, when you're thinking about previous bear markets, you said it's worthwhile studying the past bear markets. Is it different this time, you know, when you consider the global geopolitical factors? Is that something that is a question that often pops into the mind of investors? Is it different this time? Uh, uh, I haven't heard that question, actually, to be honest. Um, it is usually like, oh, my God, how do I survive? How do I get back making money? Uh, because, you know, if, especially for full time traders, they are a little bit getting desperate because they need to feed their families. So is it different this time? Well, human behavior doesn't change. We know that, right? For, for centuries and centuries, human behavior has always been repeating the same. And that's why I say the bear market rhythm will be staying um, the same as it was in the last, um, last 30, uh, 26 bear markets I think we had so far. Um, what it really comes down to, don't worry about is it going to be the same. Anyone who is a successful person in life, in general, in sports, in business, in trading, they have extremely um, well-defined um, problem-solving skills. If you look at Ash Barty, the reason why she became the world's best tennis player, her coach said, her mindset coach said, because they trained problem-solving skills in the heat of the moment. And it's also what, you know, what Louise alluded to. So don't worry if it is going to be the same. Just look at yourself and say, what skills do I need to develop in order to ace it in this market? As I said, some guys, they have their best years ever in, in the market coming down and, and it's available for everyone. And you're an optimist, aren't you, Carl? Uh, well, I'm, I'm an optimist uh, in the individual, in, 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 in people. And I've seen people make some incredible transitions uh, from buy, hold and hope to taking that responsibility because it is a big responsibility, your portfolio. It's not just for you, it's for the, what you leave behind as well. So, you know, hopefully today people have got some strategies, some ideas and, uh, and if anything, the inspiration to go out there and take control. Wonderful. Well, you've pretty much wrapped it there, Carl. Very well done. That is the end of this masterclass. Thank you to our guests, Mandy Rasanjani from tradingpsychology.com.au, Louise Bedford from talkingtrading.com.au, Nathan Samasandram from da Deep Data Analytics, and of course, Carl Kapralinga from Think Markets. And a huge thank you to our presenting partner, which is Think Markets. We do hope you've enjoyed the event. Please, if you have a friend who might benefit from what's been discussed, they can still register to watch as catch up. It's free, of course, pass that along, osbiz.co forward slash taming the bear. Thank you for watching. Thank you.